Introductory remarks, good to be with you. Uh, we're going to take this opportunity since we don't have a summer series speaker and we can't uh, sing together tonight in an extended way in a, in a uh, complete song service. I'm going to take this opportunity to continue our Every Book in a Word series. Uh, and of course, we're talking tonight about the book of Nahum. Uh, we are uh, squarely in the Minor Prophets, working our way near the end of the Old Testament. Uh, the name Nahum means consolation or consoler. Nahum describes himself in Nahum chapter 1 and verse 1 as an Elkoshite. Now often uh, it's uh, relatively easy because of archaeology and Bible geography to, to pinpoint the location of many cities, not the case with this particular city. We don't really know where it is. Some people place it in Capernaum, Capernaum. And uh, Capernaum uh, literally means the city of Nahum. And so some have speculated maybe that was his hometown. Uh, others say that this city is a city near Nineveh. And they say that because of the subject of the prophecy that he was given. We don't really have much idea about where this city is. We do know a good bit about when this prophecy took place, however. There are two things that are... Uh, addressed or mentioned in this book that set bookend dates for us. The first is in Nahum 3 and verse 8 when Nahum asks, Art thou better than, the King James says, populous no. Many other translations say no Ammon. And that relates to Thebes, which is a famous city in Egypt. Uh, a city that was destroyed by Ashurbanipal of Assyria in 663 B.C. And so as the prophet is referencing the destruction of Thebes, we know that this prophecy takes place at least sometime more recent than 663. But this book surrounds the fall of Nineveh, which took place in 612 by the hands of the Medes and Persians and Chaldeans and a sort of a united group of forces. And so we know that this prophecy takes place somewhere between 663 and 612 B.C. Uh, many uh, historians, Bible historians, put it somewhere 630 to 612 B.C. And, and maybe that's the case. But what we see here is very interesting. Uh, Nahum would be prophesying in a time of great upheaval for this great nation of Assyria uh, of which Nineveh is the capital. In 625, Nabopolassar declared Babylon's independence from Assyria. And that began the downward decline of Assyria's power because it's Babylon who would lead the charge against Assyria. And as we mentioned, by 612, Nineveh would be destroyed and Assyria would be defeated completely by 609 B.C. I didn't include this in, a sli in the slides this evening, but it is quite interesting that we also have bookend prophecies relative to the city of Nineveh. Here we have a prophecy concerning its destruction, whereas in Jonah... There was a prophecy concerning or some preaching and a record concerning its repentance. And so notice that two books in the Minor Prophets are dedicated to the city of Nineveh and to the nation of Assyria. That's how important that city and that nation was to the history of this particular time period. But what word shall we use to describe the book of Nahum? Well, tonight our word will be sovereign. And that's sort of a weird looking word, and it's maybe a word that, that we don't use every day. But I ran across a quote in a commentary that included that term, and it got me thinking. Listen to this phrase, or this, <coughs> this quote. As we make our way through the writings of these Hebrew prophets, that is the minor prophets, one thing must impress us ever more forcibly. These inspired men profoundly realized, here it is, the sovereignty of God, especially in its governmental super control of nations and history. This is vividly reemphasized in Nahum's vehement oracle 
on the doom of Nineveh. Sovereignty. The sovereign nature of God. Well, what does sovereign mean? The word sovereign means possessing supreme or ultimate power. The word sovereign has in it the word reign, R-E-I-G-N, and a word that is from the root word super, super reigning. Someone who reigns over everything else. God is sovereign. And as we think about the book of Nahum and it, it calling down this, this punishment upon Assyria and Nineveh, the lesson, the overarching lesson, the theme that we will end with tonight in our final point is God is supreme. God rules every nation. God rules over every event in history. God is sovereign. Dear friends, we live in a, in a world uh, uh, that is characterized in many respects by political upheaval, social and civic uncertainty, and we seem like we're in a, a ship sometimes that is, that is just uh, lost at sea with no direction and no guidance and no steerage. But God is sovereign. He's in charge. He's in control. And not a thing will happen that is outside of His sovereign power and control. And that's the lesson that we're going to learn tonight. And so our word is sovereign. And as we think about that word sovereign, we learn first of all about the, the characteristics of our sovereign God. <coughs> and I want you to notice, if you turn with me to, to Nahum chapter 1, and pick up with me in verse 1, it says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on His adversaries and He reserveth wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds are the dust of His feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, verse 4, and dries up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at Him and the hills melt. And the earth is burned at His presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein, who can stand? before His indignation. And who can abide in the fierceness of His anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by Him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust in Him, but with an overrunning flood, He will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue His enemies. And finally, verse 9, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. I want you to notice those characteristics of God and how each of those characteristics harkens back to the sovereign power of our God. He's jealous. Someone described that as the jealousy of ownership and expected allegiance. He is jealous. He expects us to be His. Exodus 20, verse 5, in the midst of the Ten Commandments, our God is in fact a jealous God. He is furious. I, I looked up the root of that word. It, it literally has two words connected to it, master and heat. God is the master of heat. What an interesting term to describe our God. He is in the midst of all of this, slow to anger. I want you to notice how intermingled with these characteristics of wrath and judgment and righteous anger are characteristics like slow to anger. The word that's translated anger in that phrase means to flare the nostrils. And we know that picture, don't we? When we become so angry that, that it's almost beyond our control, our nostrils will flare. You'll be able to physically see it in the way that our noses move. And that's the picture there. But God is patient to get to that point. 
He is, however, great in power. There's a few places throughout the Old Testament where that same word, great in power, is translated large lizard or chameleon in the King James. The picture is of something that has uncontrollable power. But notice as well it says God is good. In the midst of all of these wrathful qualities, verse 7, the Lord is good. That word good is the same word that shows up in Genesis chapter 1. After everything that God created on each of those six days of creation, He said it is good. And then He stepped back after He'd created everything and He surveyed it. He said it is very good. That's a statement of, of moral and physical uh, completeness and perfection. God says it's good. It's everything it needs to be. It's as it should be. God is good. He is at the same time jealous and furious and great in power and slow to anger and good. He is our sovereign God without question. But then you go back through the text that I read and you notice some, some metaphors to describe the sovereign power of God. You go back to verse 3 and you notice that it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord had His way in the whirlwind. You remember when God spoke to Jonah? In the middle of that book, near the end of that book, rather, He, he says, Where were you? And, and how does He appear to Job, rather, in the book of Job? He appears to him in a whirlwind raw, unbridled power, the sovereign nature of God. He's in a whirlwind. He goes on to say he's in a storm. On the minds of all of us, very likely, is, is the storm that is creeping towards our coasts and threatening all of those in the coasts and, and, and likely to wreak havoc on land in those areas. The unbridled, uncontrollable power of a storm. That is our God. He is over the sea and the mountains. He rebukes the sea, makes it dry. Bashan languish and Carmel, the flower of mountain. <coughs> Excuse me, the flower of Lebanon languish. At the mountains, verse 5, quake at him and the hills melt. Verse 5. Our God is sovereign. Verse 8 a passage that we'll come back to later on in this sermon, with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof. I was watching uh, the Weather Channel, and it, it wasn't at my house because I'm not old enough or boring enough to just sit and watch the Weather Channel for an extended period of time, but, but my in-laws likely are. And so we were there, and we were watching uh, the Weather Channel, and on the Weather Channel was a description of uh, the, the, the waves and the swells that would hit the shore. And it described how tall these possibly could be and, and how much destruction they would levy uh, on those shores. God is an overrunning flood. A flood of water is something that can wreak havoc on everything in its path. Our God is sovereign. And you can't help but read these opening eight or nine verses of the book of Nahum and not understand in his very character, God is sovereign. And then all of this comes to a head with this rhetorical question in verse 9. What do you imagine against the Lord? What do you think you can accomplish by standing up to God, by challenging His sovereign power? And yet, person after person, nation after nation, has attempted to challenge the sovereign nature of God. And you see, that brings us to our first point tonight. What do we imagine against the Lord? Why do we fool ourselves into believing that we can accomplish anything by challenging Him? You could go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and there you would see <coughs> the, the wise Solomon reflecting upon the futile attempts to go against the God of heaven. In Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 1 he says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear 
than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. He said, be careful when you come in the presence of God. Verse 2, be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. And here's the point, for God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Don't ever mistake who you are and who I am in comparison to who God is. He is sovereign. And it's easy for us to lose sight of that. You know, mankind, when we come together, we seem to convince ourselves that we're unstoppable and that we're invincible. It happened in Genesis chapter 11, you remember? Tower of Babel. They created a tower. They said, Let, let's, let's challenge heaven. Let's, let's go up, build a tower up to heaven. Now, did they really believe they would reach heaven? I, I don't know, but they did want to challenge God. And, you know, I thought this would be a good sermon sometime in the future and maybe there's a preacher listening tonight or someone who will be preaching or teaching a class and maybe you can turn this into something useful. Think about the towers that man erects in challenge to God. A tower of science. And, oh, we, we pour so much of our efforts into scientific pursuits convinced that we can find a way to eradicate God through science. And so we build the tower of science. Maybe, maybe through philosophy and, and the wisdom of men, we can build a tower and we can challenge God. Maybe through false religion. And you name it, the towers that we build to challenge the God of heaven and to challenge His sovereignty. But dear friend, what do you hope to accomplish? What do you imagine against the Lord? What can you actually accomplish before the sovereign God of heaven and earth. And that's what we learn from those first nine verses of Nahum chapter 1. Then number two, as we continue through the book of Nahum, we see the sovereign God's sovereign plan. And this plan is very simple, and, and by the time Nahum comes on the scene, the, the plan is beginning to really take shape even uh, on the part of those who may not be very ready to see it. First thing that's going to happen is God is, as He mentions in chapter 1, He's going to break off the yoke from His people. Look at chapter 1 and verse 13. For now will I break His yoke, that is a serious yoke, from off thee, God's people, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. He references this again in chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, He dasheth in pieces... He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition. Watch the way. Make thy loins strong. Fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord has turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. The emptiers have emptied them out and marred the vine branches. He said, look, I've punished Israel. They have received the consequences of their actions. Now, now, it's time to restore them. And you know, there's a couple of things that need to be mentioned relative to that. The point for Assyria, number one, is this. If God would punish His people, what do you think He's going to do to Assyria, that wicked and heathen nation? If God has already destroyed his people's land and taken them, sent them into captivity and in punishment for their sins, what would he do with a holy godless nation? Well, the Syrian needs to answer that question for themselves. And then the second consideration is this. You see, God used Assyria as the means to punish His people. But you know, now He's done with Assyria. So what's going to stop God from exacting His punishment against Assyria now? You see, Assyria has fulfilled its usefulness. And now they will suffer the consequences of their actions and transgressions. So God's plan number one is He's going to break the yoke of Assyria from off of the neck of His people. But then number two, He's going to bring Babylon to destroy Assyria. <clears throat> you pick up with me in chapter 2 and verse 3. And I want you to notice the language of war. The shield of his mighty men is made red. This is Babylon, I believe. 
The valiant men are in scarlet. Now, commentators have often wondered why the scarlet and why the red. Are they red because that's the color that those uh, armaments were? Or are they drenched in the blood of their enemies? I, I tend to think maybe that's the blood of Assyria. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. Verse 4, the chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broad ways. Have you ever seen video footage of tanks rolling through residential cities? If you've ever watched war movies or if you've ever seen footage uh, from, from uh, invasions and you see a tank roll through a residential street, uh, the, the juxtaposition is shocking. And that's exactly what God is describing in verse 4. He says the chariots will jostle one against another. There will be chariots riding two side by side down the residential streets of Assyria. It will be an occupation and a destruction like they have never known. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like lightnings. He shall recount his worthies. Assyria will say, bring our worthiest men. They shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the defense shall be prepared. The gates of the river shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. We'll revisit that in a moment as well. And the fact of the matter is that war is coming for Assyria, and God is the force behind it. We recognize as you continue to chapter 3, <coughs> pick up in verse 1. Woe to the bloody city, it's all full of lies and robbery. The prey departs not, the noise of a whip, and the noise of the rattling of wheels, and of the prancing horses, and of the jumping chariots. I want you to notice the imagery. God says if you listen really close, you can already hear the chariots rumbling through the streets, the whips on the horses as they charge valiantly ahead. Can't you already hear the noise of war? coming to Assyria. And then he goes on and he says this in verse 3. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain, and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. The dead will be piled up at the face, at, at, at as they face God's judgment through the nation and the, and the army of Babylon. And then you look at verse 13 of chapter 3. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. In other words, they're not warriors trained for battle in the face of such a great army. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Draw thee water for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Go into clay. Tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven, but the canker worm spoileth and flieth away. And I want you to notice verse 18. This statement really sums it up. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Syria. There's no hope. The shepherds are asleep. Your doom is unavoidable. And so we see God's sovereign plan. But as we conclude tonight, I want you to think about the sovereign God's message. And the first message I've alluded to, I said there were two passages that we would revisit. I want you to notice, first of all, a quote relative to, this is from history, relative to the destruction of Assyria. You see, Assyria had tried to flee the city of Nineveh. But the armies of Babylon and their uh, allies had pushed them back into the city. And so they had shut themselves in the city. And they were just going to do the best they could. For two years, they resisted. For two whole years. But then, as this quote makes clear, an unusually heavy flood of the Tigris 
carried away a large section of the huge rampart. That's the wall that surrounded the city. And the Babylonian army used that breach to enter into the city and destroy it. Now, I want you to revisit a few passages that we noticed as we marched through Nahum. Look at chapter 1 and verse 8. But with an overrunning flood, he'll make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Isn't that amazing? The historical record tells us that it was a flood that opened up the city of Nineveh for destruction. And God said it will be an overrunning flood that brings destruction. Chapter 2 and verse 6, remember we said the gates of the rivers shall be opened. That's a flood. And the palace in the city of Nineveh shall be dissolved. God said it would happen. And it happened just like that. God's prophecies are sure. And how many times as we navigate through the Bible do we see situations just like that? So understand that when God says something, it's going to happen. But then number two, and we alluded to this at the beginning. Daniel 4 and verse 25, as Daniel is discussing this matter... (coughs) <coughs> of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance and the fate that will await Nebuchadnezzar. In verse 25, he says, Here's what's going to happen. They shall drive thee from men, Daniel 4, 25, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times shall pass over thee until, here's the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar has to learn, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. God is sovereign. And dear friends, in this world in which we live, there is no message that is any more timely than that message. God is sovereign. Psalm 9 and verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Every nation and every individual that rejects God will suffer the same fate eventually. Romans 13 and verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. At the end of the day, our God is in charge. You remember in Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes, uh, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You know, it's easy for us in this life to say, well, well, but God, it doesn't always happen like that right away. We don't always see people getting their just desserts. We don't always see wicked people suffering the consequences of their wickedness and righteous people reaping the rewards of their righteousness. But remember, God is sovereign and eventually people get, nations get, the things which they deserve based on their actions. How many times did the God's people, the people of Judah, uh, in particular with Assyria, the people of Israel, how often did they say, how can you let a heathen nation destroy us? And God's ultimate message is, they will get what they deserve as well. You see, we recognize this evening that God is... Sovereign. And at the end of the day, when all is said and done, when judgment comes, God will reign and God's judgment will prevail. I hope as you have gone through the book of Nahum with me tonight that you have learned that fundamental lesson, been reminded of it again. Our God is sovereign, He's jealous. He is a God of vengeance against those who reject Him. But He is good. 
slow to anger. He is our sovereign God. And dear friends, it does us no good to challenge Him, to, to raise our fists at Him, to defy Him, because at the end of the day, His judgment will still prevail. At His word, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Dear friend, I hope that you are convinced of the sovereignty of God. And if you are, then the question that must be asked is, is God the sovereign ruler of your life? Well, how do I know if He is? Well, does, does He govern the things that I do? Number one, have I submitted to Him? You know, in order to become a citizen of this country, there are certain requirements that you have to meet, that, that certain things that you have to do. It's no different to become a citizen of God's sovereign nation, His Son's body, the church. Are you willing to believe in Christ? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Are you willing to repent of your sins? Peter said, repent and be baptized, Acts 2.38, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Are you willing tonight to do that? To confess the name of Christ and to be baptized and wash away your sins. Submit to the sovereign God. But maybe as a Christian tonight, maybe you're within the sound of my voice and you have tried to shake off the burden of God's sovereignty. And maybe you've shrugged away from His command. Maybe you want to be in charge of your own life. Paul said in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Paul said in essence... I am submitting to the sovereign God. Will you do that tonight? I hope that if you are in need of submitting to God in, in obedience initially or to come back to Him, I hope that you'll reach out to us. I hope there's a way that we can assist you and help you to come into or back to Christ. Let's pray. Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we recognize that you are sovereign that you hold supreme power and authority over all things. And Father, we know that we must submit to you. Father, we pray that we will. We pray that those who are in charge of our nations will also learn to submit to you. And we pray, dear Lord, that we will allow you to guide us and to direct us as we go through this life. Forgive us, Father, if we fail you. Bring us back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.